May I invite Dr. Mark Traven to speak on MIBG in heart failure. things. Um, so for heart failure, of course, a key component of the pathophysiologic uh, process is neurohumoral uh, processes, and we know that uh, therapies directed towards these have the uh, best benefit. And, and you can see here all the different things that happen uh, with it, uh, different uh, activation of uh, sympathoadrenal, renin angiotensin system, aldosterone system, elaboration of humors, and in acute situations, uh, these are adaptive to maintain blood pressure and cardiac function, but in chronic heart failure, they become maladaptive, leading to various uh, bad things, uh, heart, you know, myocardial deterioration, remodeling, and arrhythmogenesis. And um, there are, uh, of course, these have important physiologic functions in, in normal situations, regulating cardiac and vascular volume. Uh, there are two components of the neurohumoral control system. One, the circulating hormones that you see here, and they maintain cardiac output, vascular tone, and blood volume. And what we're going to focus on here, what can actually be imaged with nuclear imaging, would be direct innervation. Of course, there's both a sympathetic and a parasympathetic um, innervation. Parasympathetic is with acetylcholine. Some research uh, imaging, but not much clinically. The one we're going to focus on is sympathetic imaging, uh, done with, uh, which is norepinephrine, the mediator. We have um, radionuclide analog analogs that can look at it. And um, we're going to look at some abnormalities in that and how we can image it. Um, as I said, norepinephrine is the main component of, um, of a sympathetic um, function. And norepinephrine is syn uh, synthesized in the presynaptic terminal in response to a stimulus. Its release goes into the synaptic space, binds with receptors on the target myocytes, and causes increased contractility in various um, physiologic, normal physiologic functions. And then to control it, it's taken up by this membrane protein uptake one and accumulates in the presynaptic terminal. Um, we can look at an analog of something like norepinephrine, actually more specifically a false neurotransliter, guanethidine, and we get metoirobenzoguanidine. We attach a I-123 that could be imaged. When you inject it intravenously, it diffuses into the intracardiac space, taken up as norepinephrine would be, but MIBG, since it's a false neurotransmitter, it's not metabolized. It therefore accumulates and allows us to um, visualize this. We see two things. Number one is the neuron present, as opposed to not present being de-innervation, like in SCAR, or it could be present and then these functions are just not working, and disinnervation. And both of those, if they're present, um, are a problem. Uh, these are the typical image th items that we measure, the uptake in the heart compared to background, the heart to mediastinal ratio, you see a normal number there. We, we do an initial planar and a delayed. We look at washout, a high washout's bad. And we can also do tomographic imaging, looking for uh, heterogeneity of uptake, which may um, predispose to arrhythmias. And here's an example. Here's a normal looking image, and here's an abnormal looking image. And there and that. Now, for various reasons, Clinical imaging, especially in the U.S., is currently stalled. It is widely, widely felt that the technique has unique value and can improve management in heart failure and other conditions, but it's not being used for reasons which we're going to go into. So where should we go from here in this regard? Well, we should go over what can we confidently say about um, adrenergic imaging with MIBG. Well, we know the ability of MIBG imaging to effectively risk stratify patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction has been established. There's no doubt about that, and there are numerous studies that show it. An initial key study was from France showing heart failure patients with low EF. If the heart uptake is low, they're at more risk of death. Uh, small studies were done after that. One of the uh, larger one was this one from the uh, Netherlands, Jerome Bax, and so on. Patients with EF less than 35%, low cardiac uptake was associated with a two-year event rate. Meta-analysis done by Hein Verburn showed that uh, High washout and low heart mediastinal ratio, looking at 18 studies, close to 2,000 patients showed worse outcome, cardiac death, and other cardiac events. The landmark study 
was an observational cohort, well-designed, multi-center, including US, Canada, and Europe, about 1,000 patients. And they saw that in patients with class 3 heart failure, EF less than or equal to 35%, class 2 to 3, I should say, a low heart mediastinal ratio increased your incidence of heart failure progression, death, and lethal or potentially lethal arrhythmia. And then looking specifically at heart events, death, and uh, uh, death, you could see that even with advanced heart failure, if your uptake of MIBG was good, your event rate was almost zero, which meant you could actually find a low-risk group of patients in this group. Uh, a study that actually reproduced that was done in Japan, a separate analysis totally, where they looked at their database of about 1,300 patients, and they essentially reproduced what was seen in the um, Admire HF. So studies have consistently shown a key very robust, effective risk stratification of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and it's on that that the FDA indications for MIBG for cardiac imaging have been established. The other thing that's consistent, um, it, well, it also has been shown to have a, even a effective value in heart failure with preserved EF. The Japanese study I showed you previously had that, and there was another study from Japan showing that. So it's good not only in the heart failure HEFREF, but also in the half path. And again, everything we look at will show that it works when you do these things. Now, it just doesn't look at something else other studies, other parameters do. It's actually an independent risk, track, risk factor um, here, independent of BMP and ejection fraction. The original French study showed it was independent of ejection fraction. Uh, this is Admire HF, independent of VF, New York Heart Association functional class, BMP. Um, again, uh, in terms of mortality, also it's there. Um, and in the Japanese study also. So, and then even if you have a comprehensive Seattle heart failure risk uh, model, the MIBG adds something different. So MIBG, adrenergic imaging, is looking at something different than these do. And in many cases, it actually can risk stratify better than that. In heart failure, of course, one of the major causes of death is heart failure-associated arrhythmias. And MIBG imaging to risk stratify patients in terms of the risk of ventricular arrhythmias is consistently demonstrated. And that would make sense because when we look at the causes of arrhythmias, we, the basis that people often use is ejection fraction. That's, but that's nowhere listed in here. Ejection fraction is remote from arrhythmia. It's kind of a crude thing. And one thing we know is that autonomic abnormalities are mechanistically related to arrhythmias. So we would think MIBG or adrenergic imaging would be also. One of the first studies, this is something a fellow uh, with me uh, looked at way back 20 years ago or so. We looked at patients with defibrillators already, and we, d we picked out patients with arrhythmias and those that didn't, and we saw that the cardiac uptake in terms of the heart mediastinal ratio effectively separated the patients. Uh, Dr. Nakata from Japan, Hokkaido, that actually worked on that study with me, did his own study in Japan, more prospective, and he saw that um, heart mediastinal ratio predicted lethal events independently from ejection fraction and independently from BMP. And in Admire HF, the risk stratification, the largest study, 1,000 patients, it was also, if you had a good heart mediastinal ratio, your risk of a lethal ventricular event was very small. And that was planar. Tomographic imaging is a little uh, interesting. That the worse your, you know, if your images are abnormal, you're more prone to an arrhythmia as opposed to a, a low one. But actually, as you get very high with abnormalities, decreased uptake, but more homogeneous, you're actually less likely to die of arrhythmias, either because you have more homogeneous decrease or you're more likely to die from heart failure. So it's actually the intermediate patients that are probably uh, most at risk. Uh, tomographic PET show, shows the uh, same thing. Um, and again, not only is it predictive of arrhythmias, but it's independent of other markers associated with arrhythmias, independent of EF, independent of BMP, and independent of a host of ECG variables. Um, so now, so there's no doubt that it risk stratifies heart failure events, heart failure reduced EF, heart failure preserved EF, and risk stratifies patients at risk of uh, arrhythmias. The question is, what is the clinical effectiveness? Can we actually use this to manage patients effectively? I mean, it doesn't help these days to say we can you know, predict the future. So that's where the challenge has come. We know that it, it can follow how patients are responding to various medical therapies, beta blockers, and a host of other therapies. 
This is a study I always show from Japan where they follow patients with these heart media stun ratio over time, and they saw that patients who were non-survivors were more likely over time to have the MIBG images get worse. So you can see who's not responding to medical therapies, and the thought is that can help direct your use of the cardiac electronic devices there. So here's something you could potentially do in a clinically effective way. And people have looked at it in terms of cardiac resynchronization therapy, and it's been shown that patients who respond most effectively to cardiac resynchronization therapy in terms of improved echo findings are those with the higher heart mediastinal ratios, where those with the lower heart mediastinal ratios are less likely to respond to CRT and actually just do poorly. So this, perhaps you can use this to identify which patients are best, you know, in addition to uh, the synchrony and, and other factors, IVCD, to see who's going to respond. LVADs. Patients get LVADs these days, and again, if somebody's not responding to medical therapy, getting worse, you may identify someone who needs an LVAD sooner, number one. Number two, these patients, you may be thinking for transplant, but if you could put the LVAD in them and actually have reverse remodeling and remove the LVAD, then those would be patients who might not need a, a transplant. And this one study from Japan actually showed that based on the washout ratio, something I mentioned to you before, can predict which patients may reverse remodel with the LVAD, and you might find a group of patients that are more likely not to lean their LVAD and therefore would not need a transplant. And then again, the thing people are looking for is the implantable defibrillator. Can you use it for that? And there's really only one good study that looked at this, I would say, from the Netherlands, where they show that if you, um, you know, if you put in the it's above a a spec of a score of greater than 20, those would be the ones most likely to get defibrillator shocks. It was, again, predicting how they would respond to the defibrillator, but didn't show in terms of how they would do sur with survival, and that's the, the, been the issue. There was a randomized study that was looking at it, taking patients with low uh, ejection fraction and randomized them to conventional therapy, put the defibrillator in versus using MIBG with the heart media sinal ratio to risk stratify them. And unfortunately, it got terminated early because they weren't, they just couldn't recruit enough patients, not a let enough physicians would let their patients in the study. And this is kind of where we got stalled. So, you know, where do we go from here? What are the obstacles? to getting this done. Number one, of course, the, the FDA recommendations are very limited, so people are not using it for other things. But the main one is the heart failure arrhythmia communities have, have been interested, but are far from convinced, and they say we absolutely need these rigorous <laughs> prospective studies, and we're not gonna go against uh, guidelines. Um, but I would say, you know, they base this on these randomized studies, and they use this cutoff of 35%. Now, while those, that's actually misleading to use the 35%, because although these major studies use 35% as the cutoff for enrollment, if you actually look, there's a group of patients between 30 and 35% that they were underrepresented in the studies, and there's no evidence that in the 30 to 35% range, ICDs would help, and this would be the group you want to do here. All right, so these are limitations here, insufficient reimbursement. I'm just gonna say that there are, we, we can't do a planar study like this. We can't get it paid, yet we do a study like this, and this is an amyloid study. Yet we do that, excellent diagnostic utility, but there's no evidence that doing this study is actually gonna help the patient, yet we do it. This is an MIBG study, a patient at risk with arrhythmias. I can't do this study, yet we can do a study like this. This is a patient at risk for arrhythmias, and this is a sarcoidosis patient. So there are other things, that, and sarcoidosis is no evidence that this helps. So we're doing similar studies on other things, we're getting paid for it, we're doing it, but they don't have the proof either. And if you actually know perfusion imaging has never been shown that if you're doing a perfusion imaging versus not, you're gonna improve outcome. So MIBG is being held to a higher standard that these other imaging techniques are not. Uh, what's next? I've always said maybe consider you know, limited uses, again, that in between 30 to 35%, look at it more, and also patients who need battery replacements or uh, the wires are infected or so on. Technical advantages should help. CZT cameras may give more precise information, mapping and the like. 
And then there's always been work with PET imaging. Uh, there's an F-18 label tracer that's under investigation. But again, if people are not willing to do the studies and, and the pricing is not good, it's not going to be. And I would just say there, there are other imaging systems, other organ systems that, that may be important. Interestingly, uh, there's a technique called renal denervation that they've done for hypertension. But believe it or not, it affects MIBG images. And, and just someone said, uh, you know, we had the yoga thing and reducing uh, problems. It's just interesting that the sympathetic system, you know, all interrelated and all those things increase, uh, you know, affect MIBG uptake, things that predispose to arrhythmia. And it just made me think if we're affecting the, the afferent impulse to the brain with the yoga and you're decreasing the sympathetic input to the heart, which you could measure with MIBG, uh, you know, that might be why they're doing. So it would be interesting to see MIBG in response to yoga. And, you know, the, the body is all interactive, the lungs, the kidneys, and all these things, and adrenergic imaging plays a role in it, and I think this is something that unifies a lot of organ systems. Again, I'm going fast because it's kind of the end of my time. So as I said, MIBG, a consistent and robust, independent risk stratification for heart failure outcome, lethal arrhythmias, demonstrated potential to guide electronic devices, um, and uh, it's not effective to other imaging techniques. The cost in relation to reimbursement has been a big problem. And, and I think we just got to figure out how to do it and use it. We're missing out on something that I think can really help people. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, MIBG. Tracy appears very, very encouraging. But as you said, it's still not approved. Uh, well, it's approved. In the US, we can do that. You can, yes. But the cost of it is more than the reimbursement. Is it in the, any guidelines, sir? Any, any guidelines? All we have is the, uh, there's an uh, LCD, you know, the guidelines would be the FDD, heart failure level, reduced ejection fraction, past two to three heart failure, to pick out people that are low risk. Yeah. So we, the guidelines are just as risk verifications. No one's going to say you should put an ICD because in, yes or no, it can't be in guidelines until you have those perspectives. Because that make it at least yeah. a class we put two ICDs in right. large number of patients who have less than 35, and 20% only get shocks, 80% do not get anything. So it might be very good to find out which patients well, need well, ICD. Well, they tried with the study, and they couldn't enroll patients because Dr. Lumorlinda patients no, need in the study. <laughs> and even with the 30 to 35%, it was very hard to do. They just couldn't get them recruiting. Some institutions wouldn't go to the IRB. Uh, again, if, it, if the cost had been low, people might start mm -hmm. using it clinically in kind of a registry situation. Then you gain experience, and then you see it's helpful more just from experience, and then you could do a randomized study because people would allow their patients to be in the study. How much is the cost, can I ask? So, so the cost is uh, $3,000, no, $2,000 and Medicare pays $1,000. Other third-party insurances won't cover it at all. So you can't, if, if it were cheap and you could use it, people would use it and use it to make the decisions, even without the guidelines. And then you could do the studies to get it guidelines. Thank you very much, sir. Very interesting, very interesting. Any, any questions? If none, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mark. And may I request the chairperson to present the mementos and certificate to Dr. Mark Traven. Thank you, Dr. Mark Trevin.